China's State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi is in Europe to consolidate relations with a number of European countries. He told the EU countries that Beijing does not want a new Cold War with the United States. Will Europe listen? How are the Europeans feeling about the current U.S.-China confrontation? What is the potential for China-EU cooperation? To discuss all these issues and more, I'm joined by Feng Zhongping, Vice President of the China Institute of Contemporary International Relations, Francesco Sishi, Senior Researcher at Renmin University of China, and later on, hopefully, Michael O'Helen. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Uh, Francesco, let me go to you in Rome. Um, China's foreign minister Wang Yi said this, uh, I believe, in Italy, that uh, don't get dragged into whatever new Cold War the United States tries to promote. Um, how do you think the Europeans are receiving Wang Yi's uh, message? Well, of course, they pay a lot of attention. Um, in Europe, there is no uh, heart for a new Cold War. However, it is difficult and it, will, it could become very difficult for Europeans to strike a balance between China and the U.S. Also, it is important for uh, European countries to strike this balance because if uh, European countries become too close to China, this uh, could uh, backfire with the U.S. and it could ignite uh, and fuel further uh, confrontation between U.S. and China and some European countries and, uh, and China itself. So it's very delicate balance to be found and I think Wang Yi visit is uh, extremely important. It gives an, a very important message but we have to pay attention to the reception he receives uh, in the two most important countries that is in France and Germany. All right, Francesco, but do you think uh, the Europeans are on the same page with the Trump administration when it comes to opposing China? No, they are not. They, they are not on the same page, definitely. But we have also to pay attention that the United States, in the past uh, year or so, has also changed the tune in uh, its dialogue with Europe. Before, uh, Trump was uh, very much against uh, the United, uh, United Europe, uh, the European Union, sorry, and, um, uh, and uh, also quite confrontational with NATO. Now, cooperation between US and NATO is improving, and also the United States is no longer so, uh, so much against the European Union. He didn't voice any concern about the fact uh, that the European Union now has uh, issued a plan, a united plan for uh, development. And this is also a further move of the Union for, uh, for the unity. So also the United States is changing its policy. And I think China should uh, be careful about this, should pay attention to this. And Europe also wants to find, wants to improve relations, keep good relationship with, uh, with China, but this cannot be at the expenses of relationship with the mm -hmm. United States. Uh, let's get some perspectives from Beijing. Uh, Professor Feng, um, you know, what do you make of the significance of State Councillor Wang Yi's trip to the five European countries? I think, you know, uh, for Chinese foreign ministers to visit to Europe, there are many interpretations, you know, different countries, different people have different, uh, you know, explanations. From my point of view, I think, you know, Mr. Wang has some concrete purpose, you know, in his mind, and also has some broad plans uh, uh, for the concrete, uh, uh, you know, purpose. Uh, uh, as far as I know, you know, the two sides, China and the European Union, are planning to have a uh, uh, unprecedented summit uh, 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 this year, hopefully in September. This was planned uh, 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 um, uh, more than half a year ago, uh, you know, uh, at the end of last year. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, this needs need some preparation, uh, uh, you know, grant uh, uh, preparations. Uh, I think, you know, Mr. Wang's visit to these five countries is part of this uh, plan. 
Secondly, as I mentioned, the broad, you know, purpose significance is uh, you know, uh, European Union is China's uh, biggest trade power uh, partner for more than 14 years. So, whatever you know, the international international environment is about. Uh, whatever China-U.S. relation is about, uh, Europe is a significant partner, uh, a trade partner and the uh, you know, global governance partner of China. So China has a, a lot of good reasons to, mm -hmm. to maintain a, a constructive relations with European countries and the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael in Washington, D.C., uh, welcome to Dialogue again. Uh, my question to you is, do you think the Trump administration uh, with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo at the forefront can successfully persuade the EU to form an anti-China alliance with Washington? Not yet, and I don't think it'll ever be necessary, but Pompeo may attempt tighter uh, restrictions. I think you're right about that. But I don't think anyone's in the mood for a fundamental decoupling uh, or, to use another popular phrase, a Cold War. I think that's too much. Certainly, a lot of countries agree that the relationship with China needs to be rethought and modified. But I think that may apply to certain specific sectors, for example, 5G. And even there, as you're well aware, there is disagreement within Europe about the U.S. view uh, that Huawei and others should be simply kept out altogether. So I think the United States will have some success in regard to high-tech industry, in regard to intellectual property, in regard to 5G at least with certain countries. But I don't think that Europe will favor some kind of a broad-based cooling of the relationship, uh, except where it's necessitated by specific problems. Mm -hmm. Let's look at some comments online here, folks. Um, we have uh, lots of comments um, about uh, State Councilor Wang Yi's trip in Europe and also the triangular relationship between China, EU, and America. For example, Stilt. This friend says Europe has been caught in the middle of escalating tensions between the U.S. and China, with countries in the bloc forced to balance ties with an important security ally and a global trading partner. Um, Sichi, uh, you know, some European politicians are joking that uh, if Europe doesn't become a player, it will be a playground. Uh, do, you, do you agree? I mean, do you look at that way too? Well, uh, Europe uh, is... Uh is already unfortunately or fortunately depending on the point of view a playground but um, uh, what I what I see in these uh, in these uh, few months what I've been seeing in these few months is that uh, the European Union is more coming together because uh, uh, facing COVID and this uh, epidemic as um, bringing all countries uh, more together not only for practical uh, reasons, because uh, you need a coordinated policy to relaunch, to, to, to have funding to, for investment, and this is already happening. And the center of this greater coordination is Germany and France, which are, I would say, more understanding of the concerns of smaller countries or weaker countries like Italy and of the Union. This is already happening. Now, how could this translate into the relationship with China? We have to see in the next few months, but I think also this will depend on two elements. On the behavior of the United States with China, of course, uh, with China, of course, but also the behavior of the United States with the European Union and also on uh, what China will do in the next uh, few months. Um, there is a lot of concern, growing concern, about uh, some developments in Hong Kong and in other places. Um, this uh, uh, could play a role also in how European countries, one by one, or the Union, all together will uh, decide to to, to act. Sure, those are certainly China. very important uh, security issues uh, and uh, potential points uh, of um, you know, friction over there. But uh, Francesco, you talked about EU-US relations. And how do you think uh, EU-US relations have changed uh, you know, in the past four years uh, you know, during the Trump administration? 
I mean, the two sides certainly don't see eye to eye on many issues, right? Like the Iran nuclear deal, climate change, and NATO spending. Right. What we have seen in the past four years is very interesting because at the beginning, uh, it looked like uh, uh, the United States was confronting Europe almost as hardly as uh, some other countries, out, uh, almost as, uh, as much as uh, China. And as the Union vis-à-vis -vis Germany, uh, also with NATO, as you mentioned. However, what I've been seeing, and we have to pay attention to this because it's a, a structural change, this mood has been changing in the past year or so. I would say that it's been changing even before the COVID epidemic and the, the pace and the acceleration of this change of the United States uh, is increasing in, the, in, the, in these few months. That is, Washington has been more understanding towards uh, Europe uh, concerns about uh, NATO, NATO spending, and the necessity for a European Union. We can see that there is also a very interesting point here. I mean, uh, Washington is no longer so vocal about Brexit. I mean, before, uh, Washington was perhaps one of the biggest supporters of Brexit. Of the now, is, uh, Washington is no longer so supportive. And of course, mm -hmm. we know Brexit is uh, an extremely sensitive issue for the European Union. Uh, well, Michael, in Washington, D.C., let me ask you this. Um, do you feel, do you share the sentiment that um, as strong allies, um, security-wise, military-wise, as uh, the EU and U.S. may be, there is, there has been growing divide between Washington and Brussels, right? Uh, French President Macron said uh, there should be, quote-unquote, autonomy in EU's foreign policy making. Well, uh, Donald Trump is still president in the United States. And it's even possible that he could be reelected, although that seems less likely uh, at this moment. But President Trump is such a disruptive president. As we know, he thrives on confrontation, at least in verbal terms. Luckily, he doesn't seem to want to use violence as much as he wants to use tough rhetoric and sanctions and tariffs. And this has been largely done unilaterally. There are places where, even with Trump's style, the United States and much of Europe have stayed together on policy. For example, uh, tougher sanctions against Vladimir Putin in Russia. But in other areas, uh, Trump is causing a great deal of tension in America's traditional alliances. And for the most part, other leaders have managed to smooth over the core uh, relationships enough that we don't see fundamental disruption on things like NATO uh, or other matters of security. But this is going to be a tense relationship as long as Donald Trump is president. And in that sense, China may be the current focal point, but I think you know, just, as, just as fundamental is Trump himself as a leader, given his style, mm -hmm. given his approach. Well, Professor Feng in Beijing, uh, let's face it, China and the EU, they certainly have differences on issues such as human rights, uh, values, and political systems. But do you think uh, that COVID-19 pandemic and the China-U.S. confrontation right now is somehow allowing China and the EU to overlook some of those differences and build uh, closer ties? OK. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I think, has some uh, um, positive impact and also uh, negative ones on the uh, EU-China relations. You know, uh, as far as I understand, the, the European perception on China during the pandemic crisis, uh, 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 especially in the early stage, uh, was quite negative. You know, uh, 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 actually, you know, uh, different from what you uh, you said, uh, um, the difference between the two countries, the two sides, has been uh, increased. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the uh, 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 you know how to handle this uh, 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 crisis. Um, but you know, the misunderstanding has been reduced in the recent weeks, or if you like. Uh, uh, so I saw uh, the the report and the you know uh, 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 
uh, people's uh, 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 you know uh, value evaluations of Wang Yi's visiting Rome and other European capitals. I think it, you know it has become uh, 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 more positive uh, on this issue. Uh, 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 the the op positive side, uh, uh, this this uh, pandemic has uh, uh, led resulted in the China-European relations is is the economic one. Uh, uh, I think more and more people in Europe, uh, uh, I understand, uh, are, uh, are talking about the post-war, post, uh, I'm sorry, pandemic. Uh, economic uh, corporations, uh, you know, China is the uh, is the uh, is the biggest market in the world, and, and uh, it's a, a important economic partner of many European countries. So, uh, with the cooperations between the two sides, I think uh, it will be important for two sides to to come out this current uh, 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 you know uh, economic crisis. Uh, uh, I, I hope you know this can be. Realized, and I hope this can be uh, discussed uh, during the Mr. Wang Yi's visit in Europe. Right. Well, people are still talking about uh, State Councillor Wang Yi's visit to Europe, and uh, you know what uh, China-EU ties may look like uh, amid the current U.S.-China confrontation. For example, William Bill said, "Any cool-headed person with an objective view will see that for China and the EU, cooperation far outweighs." competition and the areas of consensus far exceed differences. In short, China and the EU are partners, not rivals. Um, Francesco, you know, talking about cooperation, um, people are focusing on one specific issue that is bilateral investment treaty. Uh, in July, China and the EU said uh, they're making progress on uh, the BIT uh, with the goal of concluding the talks by the end of this year. How important do you think a bilateral investment treaty will be for um, you know, both Europe and China? I think it could be very important. It could be very important here. Uh, of course, uh, many European countries, but the leading European countries, of course, is Germany, which uh, I think uh, almost uh, has al about half of uh, the trade between uh, uh, China and Europe is uh, spearheading this, uh, this treaty. As far as I know, there are still uh, a lot of knots uh, to be resolved, but if this uh, treaty is signed, uh, it could be an important st uh, step towards, uh, I would say, a new normal situation. And this could have also a positive impact uh, with, uh, with the United States. I mean, because an improvement in relationship between Europe and China could actually provide an example and experience for the U.S. So maybe to follow or to look at. So it could be, it should be very, very important. Uh, Professor Feng in Beijing, what do you think about this uh, bilateral investment treaty between China and the EU? What will it do to bilateral trade and investment relations? It is very important. I agree with uh, Mr. Sisi. Uh, uh, from China's perspective, you know, uh, uh, at the moment, you know, we have been doing investment uh, uh, exercises with uh, uh, bilateral, uh, uh, at the bilateral levels with France, with Germany, you know, Belgium. You know, we don't have a European level one. Uh, uh, and look at the, the, the frictions, you know, the troubles between China and Europe in recent years. Or more than uh, in, the, uh, in the decades, it's more all focused on the trade frictions, investment, you know, frictions. Uh, so uh, and the, you know, the most complaints I understand from Europe is the, the, the you know the competition is not fair and the, the uh, uh, market access is not uh, uh, reciprocal. Uh, in other meaning, you know, in other means, you know, we, we didn't get the same degree of. Uh, 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 you know, market access. And uh, I hope, and um, a lot of people hope in China and in Europe, this bilateral investment agreement will, to a great degree, uh, uh, to reduce this kind of, uh, 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 you know, frictions and improve the uh, 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 cooperation levels. Well, 
uh, Michael, in Washington, obviously, uh, the biggest news in D.C. was the you know, acceptance speech, or was a nomination speech by Trump last night, uh, you know, t talks about uh, who will be the next president. Uh, how do you think America's uh, f you know, policy towards trade, uh, international trade, will be? Uh, you know, the, ob obviously, there are two scenarios. Uh, can you elaborate on both? Um, number one, Trump is president, and number two, Biden wins the presidency. Sure. Well, we know that Donald Trump has decided to challenge much of the existing trade order. However, his actual policies, especially here in North America, with the revision to uh, trade with Canada and Mexico and the so-called NAFTA agreement that's now been modified, uh, those policies actually are not such a radical departure from some of the ideas that existed at the end of the Obama administration, for example, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, even though, as you know well, we pulled out of TPP. But uh, the specific policies that Trump has seemed to follow with most countries wind up being that he talks very confrontationally with a lot of bluster, but at least in the North American case, he pulls back and does deals that are a little bit more reasonable with more bipartisan support. Now, what I don't know is will that, will it, will that extend also to the way he handles China in a second term, whereas we all are aware he's essentially challenged the existing relationship, but he's sort of meandered. He can't quite decide if he wants tariffs to be the centerpiece of his policy, if he wants to have these various kinds of deals with President Xi, or if he prefers more confrontation. Uh, we know that he does favor uh, uh, reducing the linkages in high-tech sectors like 5G and Huawei, and I think that would probably continue under Biden. But I think Biden would be more steady. He would look to toughen some elements of the U.S.-China economic relationship, but they would be very specific changes more in line with what we saw with the TPP proposal several years ago, and he would not try to challenge the entirety of the existing economic relationship between the United States and China, mm -hmm. or for that matter, between the EU and China. Right, uh, Francesco, um, as China and Europe uh, both emerge from COVID-19 pandemic, uh, of course, to different pace and different degrees, but uh, they are emerging from the pandemic. Uh, how important do you think China will be for Europe uh, economically? Well, it depends. We are, we ought to be optimistic and when we speak about emerging. Uh, in Europe, many people are still thinking that uh, in autumn there will be a second wave of infections, we, we still don't know, we still don't know. Definitely the issue we have here in Europe is uh, planning uh, this uh, big spending spree that we have uh, uh, launched uh, with the EU. I mean, there are 700 billion uh, euro to be spent on different countries in different projects but many countries are still unprepared. They, they are not planning, their planning is not uh, good enough. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, the main concern now for Europe and for European countries is to concentrate internally about how to spend this money. And uh, this is good and bad for China. This is uh, a time when uh, Europe is so concentrated on itself that doesn't want to be bothered with uh, foreign uh, policy issues, especially very, very tricky ones like uh, the, the one with China. So um, I don't think any European country mm -hmm. for the time being wants to be dragged in uh, very contentious issues uh, between the U.S. and right. China. Well, we, we do on hope for a speedy hand, recovery for, for the Europeans uh, you know, in the fight against COVID-19 and the fact that you can come back to Renmin University soon. Uh, sooner rather than later. Right. Yeah. Professor Feng uh, in Beijing, um, how do you look at the potential for China-EU economic and trade cooperation? You, you know, I think uh, uh, Mr. Wang Yi will talk with his counterpart in Europe on the, uh, uh, we call the, uh, uh, you know, uh, supply chain issue. Uh, this is a hot topic since the outbreak of the uh, 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 pandemic. Uh, uh, 
what does this mean? You know, people are concerned in China. So, you know, as far as Europe is uh, for us, uh, is concerned for Chinese business uh, trade, uh, but Europe is a big market. Uh, uh, you know, United States is a big market, Europe is a big market, and our neighborhood is a big market for China. So Europe is a, is a very important market for Chinese export. So uh, that is why, uh, you know, this pandemic has hit it, uh, our relationship. So uh, especially when people are talking about the reshaping of the uh, uh, supply chairs, so that also means the investment from Europe in China has also been affected. So uh, I think China is talking about, uh, is thinking about to, to cooperate with Europe uh, after the pandemic on uh, digital economy issues, for example. Uh, clean energy issues, these are two very important uh, uh, cooperation areas uh, when China thinks about with uh, Europe uh, uh, now. And Michael, in Washington, um, you know, we've heard from D.C., Washington, that the Trump administration um, is issuing, uh, you know, new range of sanctions against Huawei, uh, you know, its 5G networks and capabilities. Do you think the Trump administration is going overboard in blocking and sanctioning uh, Chinese tech firms and also in persuading their European allies to do the same? Well, I actually think this may be the area where we see bipartisan continuity in the United States. And so whatever I think about whether it's going overboard, I believe a lot of Americans now think that we need tighter restrictions on high technology economic cooperation with China because of intellectual property right disputes, because of China's rapid rise and the potential for a high tech advantage in China to be translated into the military sector and for intelligence related purposes as well. So yes, I do think that that particular change of recent years will continue under either a reelected Trump or a Biden administration. And the United States, I believe, will also try to persuade its allies to reduce high technology cooperation. In other words, the 5G issue will not go away, and issues like that will not go away. Uh, Francesco, in Rome, Italy, uh, how are the Italians look at this? Do you think Italy will be deterred by Washington from using China's 5G networks and technologies? Well, the problem is that the uh, United States said very clearly to, to Italy and uh, also to other European countries, but especially to Italy, that uh, if Italy were to use uh, 5G te Chinese technology, then the uh, uh, United States would consider to take it uh, out of NATO agreement. This would mean for Italy greater expenses uh, for defense and greater expenses for his internal security because uh, uh, both external defense and internal security in Italy is tightly linked with that of the United States. So basically, Italy cannot afford to uh, de-link itself from the United States. So no matter what uh, my wishes are or the wishes of whoever in Italy may be, I don't think uh, that Italian companies can actually use 5G if the uh, United States disagrees with it. This is, a, a, this is the reality. I think we better confront the reality and think about the future, think about different ways to see this uh, situation mm -hmm. than try to go around it. Well, that, if that's the reality, um, many people will say that uh, this is a very sad reality. Uh, I want to thank all of you, um, Professor Feng, Francesco, and Michael in Rome, in D.C., and in Beijing. Thank you all so very much. And that will do it for this edition of Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Thank you for watching.